Good day. My name is John Kuhn. I'm vice president of the U.S. Ukraine Foundation. And on behalf of the foundation, its board of directors and leadership, I welcome you to this uh, webinar, very fascinating webinar on the innovative uses of defense technology. Um, I want to thank all everyone for participating uh, with us, uh, devoting your time uh, to this uh, webinar, uh, this, to this uh, very, I think it'll be a very fascinating, informative session. I want to uh, thank uh, especially uh, Mike Budick. Uh, Mike is a, uh, has been, is and has been a, a, on uh, the foundation's advisory board for many years. Uh, he's been very active through the years in helping the foundation. Um, in addition to his task this morning, uh, Mike is uh, the organizer of the foundation's interest in the rebuilding, the uh, recovery, and the reimagining of the future Ukraine. And that's no small task. But Mike, I thank you very much for that. I make just a couple of more, a couple of other uh, mentions here. One, um, the foundation is very active in in these webinar and webinars and putting them on. Uh, I bring your attention to one tomorrow uh, that we will uh, be having. Uh, it's uh, entitled "The Forcible Transfer and Deportation of Ukrainian Children by Russia," and. It's at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, uh, Eastern Daylight uh, Time. And uh, you can go right to our website, uh, uh, www.usukraine.org. Go toward the uh, sort of the bottom uh, on events, and you can register right there for tomorrow's uh, webinar and, and future ones as well. And lastly, if um, uh, you don't, Currently subscribe, receive the foundation's emails, our communications, information. Uh, while on that website, you can also subscribe to our newsletters, uh, get on our email list. And uh, and we'd love to have you continue your interest and your participation and your support for the people of Ukraine through the U.S. Ukraine Foundation. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass the baton back to Mike and to his uh, fellow uh, co colleagues there. And uh, I wish you all the best today and uh, enjoying uh, to them and to all the participants uh, in virtual reality to uh, enjoy today's uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, John, for that introduction. I'm Mike Burek. Uh, I am the producer of today's webinar. I have been involved in reporting on Ukrainian technology for a number of years now, going back to 2017. Uh, I've been doing a monthly podcast about Ukrainian technology. And I also now do a podcast about the war in Ukraine, which appears up on the Ukrainian Weekly. In terms of Ukrainian technology, you know, Ukraine has become a powerhouse in the technology field. Uh, last year alone, there were over $7 billion in export, export revenue produced by Ukrainian technology people. But today's topic is not the entire field of Ukraine technology, but rather specifically the developing field of defense technology. And it's an important topic because uh, as Mikhailo Fedorov, Minister of Digital Transformation, said recently, <clears throat> war today in Ukraine is technological. And in addition to the more traditional weapons that have been used in the war, technology is increasingly playing a very important role. Everything from drones to cybersecurity to AI, logistics, robotics, and so forth. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the meat of the matter today. Oh, I wanted to mention also that this is only the first of a series that we're hoping on this topic. 
and uh, we'll let you know down the road when the next one will appear. Uh, in terms of some housekeeping today, um, we will do Q&A at the end of today's session. So please uh, put your questions in chat and hold them until then. And before I turn it over to Dennis Gurak, I just wanted to give you about two minutes of a video that was produced by United24, which is Ukraine's digital platform for fundraising for the military. A drone funded by ordinary people boasts an impressive 1,000 kilometers range. A bionic prosthesis equipped with artificial intelligence can autonomously anticipate precise movements. And naval drones capable of attacking enemy fleet flagships. All this is Ukrainian defense tech. But how do Ukrainians manage to create such distinctive projects amidst a full-scale war? Delfast, a Ukrainian e-bike manufacturer, secured a spot in the Guinness Book of Records for achieving the longest distance traveled on a single charge, an impressive 367 kilometers. After 2022, the company developed a reinforced model of its bike specifically designed for off-road use on the front line. Their website now showcases grenade launcher operators on electric motorcycles. Drones have emerged as prominent players in this war. The battlefield is now frequented by both Bayraktars and tiny black hornets. Military channels are full of videos showcasing commercial UAVs launching attacks on the occupiers using homemade drop systems for VOG grenades. Besides that, it's worth noting that Ukrainians are manufacturing their drones too. Have you ever joined efforts with friends to raise funds for a special cause? The PD-2 drone, developed by Ukerspet Systems, is a prime example as its name, People's Drone, reflects the fact that ordinary Ukrainians contributed the funds for its development. The PD-2 offers an impressive 1,000 km range, powerful optics and a thermal imager. The PD-2 plays a crucial role. And so that's just a taste of that video which you can find online uh, in YouTube if you go to United24 Defense Tech and Ukraine Military. At this point, I'd like to introduce Dennis Gurak, who is an experienced sea level manager and serial entrepreneur. He's currently CEO and co-founder at ADAM, a 3D bioprinting company, which is primarily focused on 3D printed bones. Dennis is an experienced uh, person from the Ukraine defense tech industry. In 2014, he joined the Ukrainian defense in industry as Deputy Director General for Foreign Economic Activity. And he also represented Ukraine as the head of Ukraine's uh, delegation to the NATO Industrial Advisory Council. And finally, but not least, he is also a partner in the FF Venture Fund which has put together a fund now to invest in Ukrainian tech startups. So with that, Dennis, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Mike, for the introduction. Um, thanks for uh, organizing this uh, great event. And it's a pleasure you know, to um, be here and to uh, moderate this um, webinar. So I would like to also present our today's participants because uh, uh, we've tried to um, arrange uh, this group, you know, to provide various points of view, both from the government uh, and ecosystem side, uh, as well as from the manufacturer side, but also from the VC community. Um, so today with us, we have Natalia Kushnerska, who's the COO, Chief Operating Officer of Brave One, a Miltech cluster that Ukraine has recently launched uh, as a response, as a systemic response to um, um, organize um, Ukraine's defense uh, tech uh, community into one streamlined process and provide fast track for um, defense startups. We also have Valeria Yakovenko, who's the uh, CEO of Drone UA, a um, company that has been primarily focused on civilian um, applications of drones and has been active for many years. But uh, since the full-fledged invasion, they have been um, switching the efforts like many others 
uh, to um, provide support and uh, help uh, Ukrainian military to uh, counter the aggression. Um, and we also have Vitaly Laptanak, who is the co-founder and CEO and managing partner of Flyer One Ventures and Genesis, a big Ukrainian um, IT um, holding plus a venture fund that is uh, actively investing in Ukrainian tech. Um, and the reason for having this uh, um, group here today is uh, that because we want to um, kind of um, discuss the narrative why uh, Ukrainian defense startups make sense and uh, what is the state of this industry, uh, where are its uh, prospects and um, how um, we see it, it's going to develop in future. Um, so in terms of timing and uh, structuring of our today's discussion, we'll have uh, each of the panelists, each of the participants presenting for five to seven minutes each. Um, after that, we're going to go into the discussion and some of with some of the prepared questions. Um, and uh, finally, we're also going to have a Q&A session from the audience. Uh, and altogether, we hope to um, conclude this within an hour or so. We don't have like strict cutoff time. Um, so depending on uh, how the discussion goes, uh, um, we're going to wrap it up in around an hour or so. Um, so I would like to start probably with Natalia um, and um, give her the word to present herself and uh, to present Brave One and the work that they've been doing. Um, it has been an amazing job, you know, to watch uh, how um, active Brave One has become over the, just the last two uh, months that uh, it has been established. It, it has done quite a mm, row in the um, uh, on the market and drawn a lot of attention. Um, so, Natalia, please go ahead. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Michael and John. My big pleasure. Hello to everyone. My big pleasure to talk about uh, Brave One Project uh, today. You're absolutely right. Uh, it seems to me that we have had already done a huge amount of work, but I understand that we made, I, I hope, just not even one percent of their job that we want to do. And we have a lot of things to be done. Just not to be boring, I will um, skip to the uh, small uh, deck with the presentation of the m m project. So maybe uh, with some pictures and some maybe focuses. Just to go on briefly. So our, our project is actually made by state. We have uh, six uh, state founders. We have Ministry of Digital Transformation. We have general staff. We have Ministry of Defense. We have uh, Council uh, for National Security and Defense. We have Ministry of Economy and we have Ministry for Strategical uh, uh, Industries uh, of Ukraine uh, within this project. So now we are focusing on five things to invest, to give grants to the uh, defense tech companies in Ukraine, to give them a hand to develop their first prototype, or to go on preparing documentation or everything they might need to actually to finish their product, to, to finish their uh, first prototype. The second one is to invent, understanding what are the gaps and what are the needs of the uh, our defense forces to find these solutions among Ukrainian companies, or if these uh, solutions are not presented in Ukrainian market, to be open for international cooperation in these tracks. The third one is unique entry point, unique entity, un unique platform for, for everything uh, connected with Ukrainian defense tech. The fourth one is to showcase actually to gather together in one system of Ukrainian defense tech, not depending on the uh, stage of readiness of that products. Maybe it's on idea level or maybe it's already a big industrial production. Each of them, um, we want to showcase them to general uh, staff to understand whether they need it or they don't need it and that's products which are uh, prioritized and which i need for defense forces needs to boost them actually to give them all any support actually and how they they might need i mean uh, starting as well 
as I've told already, started from grants, attracting investments, uh, testing ground, cooperation with the Ministry of Defense, improving their technical requirements. So everything they uh, do, regulation questions. So everything to make them result and to make them develop. So now after two months and a half that we've launched our projects, we have 327 developments applied already on uh, our platform. We have 138 developers that already passed general staff expertise, and we have 100 developments which are um, prioritized for needs of the defense forces. So um, we are really, and uh, thank you for the video we've started with, actually, we are very honored and very, uh, very proud to have actually all that uh, uh, companies. And uh, I want to say that Brave One, it's about, not about only drones or not about uh, like robotic, it's about anything connected with, with defense tech in Ukraine. And we are good. And now we are focusing on um, robotics. Now we are focusing on electronic warfare as well. We understand that AR, um, battlefield management systems, uh, medtech, demanding, so anything, even filters for special uh, you know, for water that can be used as well at defense forces needs. Uh, we are open to look for them, to expertise the, them within general staff and to go on developing them. Uh, we actually uh, look forward to cooperate with other Ukrainian companies which are not registered, registered not yet on the platform because actually we are making ecosystem and having that status Brave One helps our companies to be a member of Defense Tech uh, of Ukraine to be actually uh, to be supported with testing grounds, with uh, pitches, with networking, with communities, with hackathons, with pitching to defense forces. We are looking for any investments and for any cooperation with international companies. We are looking with for. Um, joint ventures companies were looking for uh, any technology and expertise that can be shared between our and international companies. As well, we are um, open for any media uh, cooperation within Ukrainian and international companies because we understand that um, we have really a lot of things, a lot of products to be shown uh, internationally. So, uh, Shortly uh, about Brave One, I will be open to discuss more about our opportunities and our focuses. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. This is great. And uh, personally, I'm really happy to see that uh, Ukraine has uh, finally been able to um, you know, put together a cluster um, for these uh, for defense tech companies, because I've personally been involved in uh, trying to figure out the mechanism initially when the war with Russia started in 2014, how to make this you know, industry flourish. And um, uh, currently I'm, I can confirm you know, as a VC um, that uh, there, the quality of Ukrainian defense startups and med tech startups in particular has, been, has uh, risen quite dramatically. So uh, the founders matured and uh, not only that, you know, uh, the objective um, situation is that, you know, Ukraine, well, Western media likes to uh, label Ukraine as a test bed, you know, for uh, defense innovations. You know, for us as Ukrainians, uh, we do realize, you know, market-wise that that's the case. However, you know, for us, the main priority is to win the war and, you uh, you know what? What better way to contribute to winning the war except uh, for you know, developing uh, countries' uh, technology sector? So kudos to you, and thank you so much for doing this. Now this is a very, very important job. Probably one, of, not least important uh, than um, than the fight on the battlefront. Um, so with that, I would like to go to to switch to Valery Yakovenko, who is the CEO of Drone UA. Um, as one of the representatives of the uh, uh, industry. Um, and uh, please, Valery, go ahead, floor is yours. Uh, we'd love to hear your perspective. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Valery Kovenko. I'm the founder of Drone UA Company. And uh, it is definitely correct that from the beginning of the uh, full-scale invasion, we switched from our... Uh, use of robotics technologies 
and uh, in non-military sectors to some defense capabilities. Um, we, I am representative of the market player uh, of the company, private company that actually switched uh, our own interest and our own processes during uh, the war. And uh, it is just an example how things can happen. So uh, I'd like to speak uh, not only about our company and, and our ways of development, but more, but more about Ukrainians and about companies like ours. Um, it is true that innovations are actually not happened during the war. Uh, uh, Ukraine always was innovative. Uh, Ukrainian companies always were seeking for innovation. And uh, um, for the last um, 10 years, uh, in, the, in terms of robotics and especially in terms of commercial use of drones, Ukraine become, became top 10 market of Europe. Uh, using different kind of robotics in non-military applications, such as uh, surveying, such as uh, uh, mining industry, energy sector, etc. And it happened uh, even despite the fact that purchasing capability of Ukrainian company was the lowest in Europe. So, if we are looking in the in the uh, ecosystem of the continent of Ukraine, we can see that actually Ukrainian companies and Ukrainians are pretty fast and adapting new technologies. And this uh, evolved uh, during the wartime. Before that, I'd like to mention that Ukraine is number one uh, in terms of speed of robotics in agriculture development. And even during war times, it is number one country and number one market in whole Europe you know, using robotics for their farming purposes. But when war started, full-scale invasion started, the war started exactly in 2014, but full-scale invasion started in February last year. Even our company has changed. And uh, uh, it happened that uh, many projects, many, uh, uh, many special processes that were developing in the you know, specific military-related uh, corporations, uh, they were taking years to 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 appear it took weeks and months in ukraine to make the same technological boost inside corporations and uh, during uh, the first months of the war we were accepting a lot of uh, foreign help uh, from our international partners and at the same time i was speaking with heads and ceo of the huge uh, military corporations like top 10 manufacturers uh, of the world uh, of different military equipment. And uh, we provided consultation to them how to proceed with innovation, not only in, in equipment, but in actually management, management structure. Because uh, for example, in our company, uh, within the first two weeks of the full-scale invasion, a new direction was uh, appeared, uh, has appeared and it was done completely by our employees only. So our structure became independent when uh, the coal countries uh, started uh, to, to be at war. And uh, in May 2022, I remember that uh, we had uh, made several presentations of how our company has developed, what we have done in terms of engineering or electronic warfare development and uh, it was a presentation done to the board of uh, board members and directors board of huge military corporations with billions of dollars of turnover each year. Well, uh, it is just an example when we uh, see at the, in at the innovations as one of the key strategic points to win the war. We have to be technological and we can see on the battlefield how technologies can help to save our uh, lives and lives of our soldier, soldiers. So right now I must emphasize that the ecosystem development such as was done uh, with the help of uh, Brave One initiative and all the projects that are running on, the, on behalf of Ministry of Digital Transformation and etc. they are actually creating a possibility for more companies like ours to change to appear and more foreign investors to come into Ukraine to invest in the technology and technologies that will protect the future. So I'd like to proceed with conversation after we'll share all details that we have achieved so far 
But it is true that we are in need of innovations and the world is in need of innovation and they are appearing here in Ukraine. Thank you, Valery. Um, it's really encouraging to hear, you know, that your um, experience uh, has been positive. Uh, we'll probably talk about this uh, during the discussion, but I would love to hear, you know, um, your points and your view on what is lacking, you know, because uh, the attention is there. Uh, however, you know, there is this continuing ongoing discussion about, you know, how to finance the rebuild of Ukraine. And everyone is sort of waiting for something to happen for the war to end on the civil side. However, on the military side, the war is now, so it needs to be financed now. And obviously, you know, the uh, uh, Western partners are given, uh, providing a lot of uh, help um, uh, on the conventional side now, but whether this, you know, help and cooperation is happening uh, practically with companies like yours. I would love to know about that. And I think uh, our uh, today's attendees uh, will also would uh, like to hear about this as well. Uh, but let's pause for a bit and give the floor to Vitaly, um, who's the uh, managing partner and co-founder of Flyer One Ventures, which is uh, one of the most active uh, venture funds uh, in Ukraine and Central and Eastern Europe. Um, the VC community has been looking um, and started to look quite extensively at uh, the startups that started emerging as a response uh, to the full-fledged invasion. And uh, Vitaly is uh, one of those who has been uh, doing that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So Vitaly, please, floor is yours. We'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, thank you so much, Denis, uh, and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Vitaly. I'm actually, I'm kind of sitting on two chairs here because I'm also co-founder of Genesis and I'm general partner at Flyer One Ventures. And Genesis is one of the biggest technology companies in Ukraine. So we have around 3,000 employees in Ukraine. So it's... Um, uh, from like first day of the war, we started to invest heavily in uh, in the victory. So, but first it was like um, I don't know buying cars, buying drones, buying something. Uh, and at some point, we just understood that we need to do something uh, more uh, systematic, more uh, strategic, and more uh, long term. And we launched a school of captains uh, to uh, teach uh, kind of army middle management um, to help to teach. Of course, we don't teach, we just provide infrastructure and financial support uh, for um, army instructors. Uh, so like hundreds of uh, military uh, officers uh, went through the schools with the school. Uh, and uh, so we also understood that uh, one of the like more long-term and systematic way to uh, help Ukraine win this war is to invest in uh, technology companies that are focused on uh, building um, uh, building drones, building technology, building uh, something that could could help to defend uh, our country. Um, actually, like the thing is that, uh, like from personal perspective, our C four of our four fund of Flyerman Venture is fighting now on uh, on the battlefield. Uh, so uh, we kind of personally invested in this process, and uh, he he could provide us like direct experience what is like uh, really needed on the front line. Um, yeah, but uh, the, the problem is that uh, for us, uh, like for as a, as a fund, uh, we see that uh, like a lot of great technology is being created in Ukraine, but uh, it's not like kind of real companies. They like understandably they uh, focused on um, like probably building as as many. I don't know drones or uh, something uh, something else for um, for the army, but they're not building kind of uh, long lasting structures, long lasting companies for uh, for 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 the future for uh, for 
like uh, period of time after, after the victory. So for us, this is kind of the, the biggest challenge on this market because we've been looking uh, for uh, military technology startups for quite a long time, but only a couple of uh, these companies, uh, like only a couple of these contacts led to concrete discussion and uh, maybe possible deal. Um, so for us, for us, this is uh, the biggest challenge. But and, and and I suppose this is something that could be uh, helped by um, our international partners, uh, like with like practical experience of building military technology startups in the United States or uh, other other countries uh, in Europe or somewhere else. Uh, so yeah, basically our main goal now is to find great startups uh, in military technology and find someone who could help uh, this great uh, Ukrainian guys with um, a real practical experience to build uh, companies uh, that could last uh, like uh, longer uh, than uh, this war. So yeah, uh, that's basically it. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Vitaly, for your perspective. And I think it's uh, in, in this whole discussion, it's the most important one, um, you know, how to build sustainable businesses out of those um, emerging technologies. And uh, my question to you probably in advance would be to think, and maybe you could give your perspective once we progress to discussion on, uh, you know, how do you see, uh, you know, as a classical VC focused on software, you have some benchmarks and uh, which in which startups you are investing, and I don't want to go into that discussion. You know, uh, which benchmarks are those? But obviously, for military startups, they are very different. So uh, the question to you would be: As a VC, are you prepared to, you know, do your like? What's your attitude to that? Like, because the scalability, the uh, life cycle. And just the very principles of, of uh, military startups, which are, are are different, you know, because of the market uh, specifics all, and all that. So uh, please think about that. And I would love to hear a bit more about uh, that perspective once we progress uh, to discussion. So um, with that, I would ask the audience to start putting questions into the chat uh, or to, into the Q&A um, tab. Uh, down below which you have there and I will um, we will pick up the most interesting ones and uh, if the time permits you know we'll, we'll try to cover as much as possible uh, but um, in the meantime I would like to frame the discussion a little bit um, and um, just um, give a little perspective on um, what could be, you know, like why defense startups in Ukraine, Ukrainian defense startups make sense in general for the global market. So um, obviously defense business is a geopolitical one. And, um, you know, with the tectonic and systemic changes that are happening as we speak, hopefully today, tomorrow we'll hear you know, and at the Vilnius NATO summit that Ukraine is going to become a member of NATO once the war ends. Uh, all signs point to that one way or another. I think, you know, the uh, belief globally is that it's going to happen. So um, this was not, you know, the case even two years ago before the full-fledged invasion. No one believed that that would be the case. So um, what... So with the uh, level of um, capabilities in um, defense and military R&D, um, how Ukraine can, can help NATO and uh, how Ukraine is able to contribute to the global security, I think that's the, the main geopolitical topic which directly relates to um, Ukrainian defense status because uh, what Ukraine has of now is the legacy uh, industry which uh, provides quite a big capability to uh, to our own military um, so um, just for the benefit of the audience here um, 
you, of course, the industry has shrank since the collapse of the Soviet Union, but uh, historically, Ukraine has been a center of R&D and uh, manufacturing in, in Soviet Union comprising, you know, very, very big parts, uh, maybe, if not half of the whole defense industry of the Soviet Union. So in 91, uh, Ukraine had 1 million people working in defense and space industries and around 700 uh, production facilities. As of now, these levels are substantially lower. Obviously, you know, Russia is also targeting Ukrainian defense factories and uh, you know, it has been a hard uh, period you know, over the last 10 years um, since the war started in 2014. Uh, however, you know, the, back, uh, the engineering talent is there. And if we're talking about hardware engineers and scientific schools, which are contributing to um, defense industry, which is radio electronics, uh, physics, uh, materials, and chemistry, uh, math, obviously, um, are all there, and they keep producing talent. And we've all seen, you know, a rapid development of uh, Ukraine's software sector over the last decade uh, or more. And the um, question is whether NATO uh, or this integration of Ukraine into the Western community, both on the NATO and EU side, uh, whether the West realizes that uh, Ukraine has this capability to actually help NATO build better and more efficient supply chains, become not only um, the you know, physical defense against the horde, uh, but also become an actual economic partner and do and cooperate in a win-win scenario. So, so that, you know, the perception of Ukraine is not, you know, uh, the country which requires constant help, donations, whatever, but actually whether it can, whether the defense industry and defense startups can create this notion and this narrative of Ukraine being actually very, uh, needed and, and providing this uh, engineering capability and talent uh, to the Western community. So with that, um, I'm, I would like to put a question uh, to our participants. Um, um, the first one would basically sound something like, how can NATO benefit from the innovative, innovative solutions offered by Ukrainian defense startups uh, amidst the ongoing conflict with Russia? Or do you believe it can? Um, and uh, yes, Natalia, please go ahead. The floor is yours. You're on mute. Yeah, see. Uh, thank you. Just um, uh, the, the, rea the reality, actually, what Valeria told, and uh, you told the same thing, that after full-scale in invasion, actually, a lot of companies making technology, they just started to do defense tech because it was uh, the only one way for Ukrainians to survive. It was uh, the only one way for Ukrainians to give a hand to their friends and families making the war on the front line and back. And uh, uh, each Ukrainian actually uh, started to, to find his own way to be uh, actually very important for, for the country and for the defending our country. And that's why uh, after actually one year and a half, and uh, we remember that a lot of, uh, not, not actually a lot of, but some companies started to do their defense technologies after 2014. And only a few of them uh, have had an opportunity to go on developing their products because actually we didn't receive any feedback from the country and we didn't receive the interest in, def uh, in developing defense tech. But after the 24th of February, we see how much technologies actually do um, uh, influence on the uh, battlefield uh, results. How do they actually uh, may give uh, uh, the symmetrical response to the resources of the enemy? And uh, if um, actually 
Uh, other countries, they just thinking about making defense technologies so or just thinking to make dual use technology. We have that, first of all, very fast feedback from the fr front lines. And this feedback, the first, yes, we have this expertise and we have very fast feedback and uh, expertise actually directly from front line. We don't uh, wait from Ministry of Defense or from general staff, somebody to tell us, oh, you have to improve your product this or that way. We're just making a call to our friends, our families on front line, uh, working person to person, actually being on front line. We, ha we know what we have to do, how we have to improve this now. And what we see, we see that some of good technologies already making abroad, they are not ready to work in realities of real born and to understand how deep is interest from um, international companies actually to make um, proven, uh, tested, uh, testing in uh, our realities. So what we have, we have very big motivation. We have really nice products and we with a uh, fast feedback with a uh, big expertise already tested and over tested and improved because when we make one technology we, we see the enemy making a uh, right re response on, on our technology so we are making this uh, just very fast and big way of improving it all the time so we are very fast we are very expertise and we have all the solutions that are already tested and that are actually effectively working and again, uh, we know that a lot of such solutions, they're working even without state procurement. They're just making their like through, through funds, through uh, private funding, and they're working on the front lines. So now they're one of the uh, as well focuses of Brave One project is to showcase good actual solutions and to uh, multiply them for use in different uh, defense forces, not only working in one team uh, or one uh, combat that they have their connections there. Thanks, Natalia. So uh, I gather that, yes, you, NATO can benefit from <laughs> cooperating with Ukraine, right? <laughs> I, I mean, that's a given, but um, kind of in my head, but uh, thanks for your perspective and thanks for the examples. And uh, uh, that's actually probably a question to Mike for the follow-up, but I'm seeing quite a lot of interest and uh, questions being put in the chat. So some of them will probably require uh, a follow-up separately. Uh, however, you know, maybe, um, well, I, I would love to hear um, like, you know, it, whether there will be a framework for the participants to follow up with uh, um, our uh, panelists today. Um, and Valeria and Vitaly uh, also want to respond uh, to this question. So Valeria, please go ahead first. Hi, uh, so basically um, in Ukraine before the war, we have seen that um, each ministry there was a position of the specific deputy responsible for the digital transformation of the the whole ministry that was involved in this question in, in such in some questions each ministry had a guy inside who was young uh boosting uh, changes inside very conservative uh, government structure and uh, it was obligatory to have this guy uh, your question was about uh, uh, what NATO or our allies will benefit out of uh, Ukraine support uh, after our win. And uh, the reply is that we are that guy who will, or, uh, who will change the uh, defense capabilities and extremely boost innovations inside military and defense technologies on the global level, on the planet level. It is our uh, responsibility to, uh, to share our experience uh, obtained from the battlefield when we have seen how technologies are crucial and, uh, uh, and exactly this will be, trans will be transferred. Technologies that are actually right now defending NATO countries, they are uh, modern, they advanced, but comparing to the speed of development inside Ukraine, they will be outdated very soon. So we need to evolve faster. We need to uh, 
uh, show or the world, uh, really the, is those technologies that are appearing right now. And if we are looking into perspective for the Ukrainian defense in one, two, three years of perspective, we can see that with the existing speed, we will outbeat in terms of development, in terms of R&D, the capabilities in uh, innovative sectors of the military attack. I'm not talking about hard armory or warship planes or, or some anything big uh, and monstrous. I'm talking about something really uh, simple and quite efficient, such as FPV drone that was never in the world used so massively to strike uh, Russian invaders on Ukrainian territory. Uh, it is really example how industries are being created within one country that is defending itself. And uh, this is not the role of the government. Actually, uh, the, the role of the government is to create such ecosystems with the help of Brave One Initiative or others. But uh, in Ukraine, despite the fact that we have huge engineering potential, huge uh, historic uh, potential in terms of you know, really good education, we also have a possibility to be entrepreneurs. Ukrainian entrepreneurs are capable to create projects, create companies, create new uh, businesses inside existing businesses to create just something new. And uh, here we can share this experience and because this is the very cost-effective way of creating new business and new technologies in the defense sector. So in combination of the speed, creativity, entrepreneurship, and uh, just innovations, this is our values that we can transfer as our support to NATO countries. Uh, thanks, Valery. Vitaly, just a moment. We have a question from the audience to Valery, so I think uh, it makes sense to um, ask it now. So uh, anonymous attendee, unfortunately anonymous, but uh, asked to what extent can drone UA customize multi-rotor drones to meet specifications for particular mission objectives, uh, uh, e.g. increased payloads, multiple different sensors, array types, etc.? I'm not sure you want to answer the <laughs> anonymous <laughs> attendees question, but uh, and uh, you know if you want to share you know a bit about the okay. capabilities of your company, that would be great. <laughs> In terms of uh, open data webinars, when everybody can obtain this kind of information, we are very sensitive in terms of what we are sharing. I didn't share my presentation. I'm just in general we're told that we what we are doing, but. Uh, our company works in the robotics field, and our expertise lies in the direction of robotics in the air, robotics on the land, and during the wartime, we have started direction of the electronic warfare possibilities. Those are directions that we are working on. In details, please, you can ask organizers my email, send me an email, and we can fold, continue this conversation if it will be not classified. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I see it. this was the question by Harrison Flint, so apologies, Harrison, I didn't notice that oh. uh, <laughs> in the beginning, so it's not anonymous, and uh, yes, so I hope you will be able to connect after the webinar. All right, Vitaly, the floor is yours. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would be really brief. Uh, I just want to add to what Valeria said, that uh, actually now it's, it, like it's decided how the next major war will be fought uh, like in 10, maybe a year, 10, 15 years. So actually like Ukrainian knowledge could help NATO a lot. Because like basically Ukraine mostly ask uh, for, I don't know, leopard, tan leopard tanks that were created, I don't know, 20 years ago, or Heimers that was created 15 years ago, or rockets that were created 20 years ago. But now in Ukraine, technology is being created that, I don't know, will be around for like next 20 years. So, and basically this knowledge is uh, really, really valuable. And like we as a fund, uh, like we'll be happy to support this and uh, I don't know, build, build something that, uh, like something that could change completely how the world for and maybe prevent the next uh, big war with some kind of AI technology or autonomous technology or something like that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Vitaly. Uh, with that, I would want 
to actually move to my next question about um, the uh, examples, uh, like uh, which uh, of the companies uh, that you have seen over the last uh, year, year and a half uh, in Ukraine. So my favorite example, for instance, uh, is the area how you is an is an AI response to detection of uh, low flying targets, and uh, when the when Russia started uh, missile barrages at Ukrainian cities, uh, it's just extremely impressive that, at least to my knowledge, three companies had emerged uh, within one month or even less. Uh, responding with their own proprietary algorithms and sensors and the very in a very cheap and effective fashion how to detect those low flying targets um, kamikaze drones and, and missiles and uh, two of them uh, are deploying their solutions for the last few months already and uh, have contributed to the security of a of Ukrainian city. So uh, that's my favorite example, but I would want to give the floor to each of the participants. Maybe you can add uh, your own example and then we're going to move to the questions from the audience. Actually, I, do, um, I think that uh, I don't want actually to, to tell about one of them because I think that everybody, uh, every team making their technologies on their level, they're very important because we can go on and looking for any technologies uh, going with electronic warfare, you know, with uh, um, working with uh, Russian spoofing and jamming, you know, of our drones and uh, as well simulators, as well, uh, like uh, any solution that helps, you know, to go on uh, answering the enemy, go uh, with the uh, robotics again, with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, um, um, with anything actually with and you know with uh cameras with uh i, I don't know with the uh, with uh, with satellites with uh, ai solutions with the mining solutions so i think that each of these technologies is very uh, in need uh, today in ukraine and i think that uh, any team working in on it now makes really very big and very important impact in uh, developing ukrainian defense tech All right, great. Thank you, Natalia. Valery, Vitaly, do you have anything to add? Do you have any good examples of uh, your uh, favorite ones? There are a lot of good examples inside our uh, company structure, inside our development. But uh, in these cases, I'd like to emphasize that uh, the market was changed. And uh, uh, I have seen uh, how many our competitors that were uh, we, that we were fighting with uh, on the civil market before uh, full-scale invasion started, how they switched uh, to the defense sector. And I'd like to admire that each of them, I believe, uh, without any exemption, started to grow their products that started to evolve. And uh, I just would like to share that uh, the market as an ecosystem successfully changed and uh, became to produce and manufacture and change something that now we can call success. So basically, uh, no details, but uh, in general, uh, we have plenty of positive uh, stories. Thank you, Valery. Um, all right, Vitaly, do you have anything to add here? Or uh, there is actually a question from the audience to you, I think. Yep. All right. So um, again, anonymous attendee, but uh, mentioning the company uh, is asking that he's representing Sirko drone team and they recently obtained Ministry of Defense contract. So they're looking to for an investor to develop further, uh, but they understand that they're not properly legally structured and have uh, many organizational issues. Um, so um, he, they're asking what homework they should do to become understandable for VC investors? Yeah, but basically it's a really, really good question. Uh, the thing is that uh, like, if you have really good product uh, with contracts that have uh, internal or export potential, 
uh, you can just contact us or any other fund and basically sometimes we can uh, help you to figure out what exactly you should do to uh, to build more sustainable business to create more um, uh, like better legal structure works work with intellectual property and so on and so forth especially given like all this import export uh, limitations and so on so um basically if you don't understand what to do just i don't know contact any active uh, fund in this field i think that uh, dennis you also could uh, could help with that and uh, at least we can show you direction where you can like sink and go from from this point mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Itali. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely want to add that you know very important for any startup is um, processing feedback from investors. So um, that's the rule number one, um, and that's a very hard thing for actually startup founders to comprehend. Because um, I'm I'm also wearing two hats as a startup founder and a VC person. So I, I understand that you know, you know putting the actually the product that would be interesting for VCs takes objectively a lot of time and it requires processing feedback not from one not from two but from dozens of investors so uh, your task as startups is to um, actually talk to as much people as you can as you can and uh, implement what they will tell you because most of them will tell you actually very valuable advice and please listen to it because you know it's it, it's it's the bread and butter of, of and it's the alpha and omega of how um, you can build the product that is investable. So um, with that, I think we're going to move to um, a last question from the audience, uh, and uh, we'll wrap up in around ten minutes. But I want to put up for discussion a actually a broader topic, uh, which um, a lot of the attendees have raised. Uh, so basically, it concerns reforms uh, that need to be done uh, both in Ukraine and externally. Um, so what um, are the bottlenecks, basically, um, that are preventing faster and more efficient cooperation and, and development of, of defense technologies in Ukraine. Um, there are a few questions, you know, specifically, uh, like what is Ukrainian government doing um, in various instances? And I'm not sure, Natalia, if you can answer this for us and help us. Um, but um, yeah, if, um, if you could just uh, start this uh, discussion with like your view and to uh, provide us some uh, info on what is the thinking inside the government now and you know apart, apart from fast track and uh, these uh, and the budget for you know drone procurement uh, and the brave one initiative in general which i think you know everyone knows about like what are these specific legislation changes that are aimed uh, and uh, what is the strategy for this uh, reforms for the next year or whatever uh, time period you're thinking about. So thank you. So you're absolutely right. Uh, today, the uh, state understands that we have to deregulate this sphere to move fast and to be effective. First of all, if you talk about fast track of Ministry of Defense, uh, when the um, proce procedures are deregulated and when the product can be deployed actually within 45 uh, up to two months actually time after all the documentations and testings are ready because before the full-scale invasion before the uh, uh, before the works actually started in ukraine it could take uh, up to three even five years to be deployed uh, the same situation and the same procedure now is uh, still working in all other countries uh, within two or three years it's really fast track to be deployed today uh, i think that for each um, defense tech product it's a very good chance actually to have first of to have and to receive first of all not a codification within this procedure and to be deployed and then when the international markets will be open with the exports possibilities so they can be exported they can 
be used, they can be uh, sold actually uh, as well uh, internationally. Because we understand that for uh, all the Ukrainian companies today, they're not making money, they are just winning this war. And all the technologies and uh, as well uh, as new products, R&Ds, and uh, their any development of the products are making and focusing on one actually bring ukraine to the victory as soon as it possible as to other points of deregulation uh, now Denise, you're absolutely right uh, first of all um money uh, actually um, were sent to uh, 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 state um, to uh, do the actually um state um, to the Ministry of uh, and, no, this is the uh, to their um, special uh, special uh, actually state special service for connection to, for buying drones and robotic systems as well. We know that uh, developing uh, and making grants and making as well different hackathons as well. We know that. Uh, the drone is like the first way, the first pos possibility to make the regulation. The first, like um, it was um, first step to do it, because now we understand and uh, we know that uh, we have uh, the possibility to put twenty five percent of their profit for the drones uh, uh, manufacturing, because before it was only one percent for their um, for the companies and thirty percent for the work. Profits now it's 25, as well as um, the um, actually the expenses for the um, companies coming from uh, other countries as well. It's uh, zero uh, uh, now for these products, so it's uh, really going on to start making the regulation and to start making development of the products and of the markets. We understand that it was not possible actually. Uh, to deregulate all the markets on the one place, but we understand the drone, it was the first step and we believe and we're waiting that all other defense technology, actually verticals will be uh, deregulated uh, soon as well, like um, it was made actually with drones. Uh, thanks, Natalia. Um, I would just like to add here um, a perspective about the, um, international regulations for export controls and because um, uh, there is a relevant question about this and what is Ukraine um, doing uh, and, and how Ukraine is approaching this. So the question um, from Dmitry Kosovai is, how has Ukraine normalized with Western standards for ITAR and sensitive defense regulation clearances and technology transfer? Has this question been addressed? And if so, have there been any difficulties? So um, I would just like to answer this question myself as uh, in my work in Ukrainian defense industry, I was actually the person responsible for uh, export import operations of um, Ukrainian state owned companies. So uh, Ukraine has been a member of all the uh, mm, traffic and arms regulations and export control regimes. Uh, since they've been uh, put in place after the collapse of Soviet Union. Uh, so both the chemical, nuclear, conventional weapons, et cetera. Um, and Ukraine has been one of the best, actually, international collaborators adhering to all of the sanctions put together by both US and EU. And, the and, and actually the notion you know, about Ukraine being sort of corrupt and uh, very you know, a shady country has been um, promoted by Russia uh, as a narrative globally. And we've seen, you know, a lot uh, in Western media recently um, after February 24th, uh, you know, how Russia is able to promote their narratives to switch the discussion, you know, into the topics that actually divert attention from the actually key uh, <laughs> key point, which is winning the war uh, and diverting attention, you know, to discussing, you know, how Ukraine is not complying with something or how Ukraine is, you know, uh, I don't know, for some reason, there was even a discussion that Ukraine will uh, sell the weapons that the West gave to it, uh, you know, to, to some terrorists. Uh, it's, it's, well, the, the, so the, the short question to summarize, you know, uh, 
Ukraine is much more developed and much more, you know, civilized country that, <laughs> than uh, there is a perception in the West. And I can tell that for sure, because I live, you know, in the US for three years. And that's the main thing which I needed to explain before the full-fledged invasion, you know, that Ukrainians are not idiots that we can, you know, do things and that we can, you know, build products that we can be actually very effective entrepreneurs. So um, um, that that's kind of the summary which I wanted to give and uh, probably close up our today's session. Um, so and um, encourage everyone uh, on the attendee side and on the panelists, you know, work with Ukraine, uh, come to Ukraine, collaborate with us. It's a it's it's not a charity. Uh, we're not looking for charities. We're looking for partners. We can provide win-win solutions and products, and uh, we're we're really open to you know any collaboration on the global level uh, that there might be. Thank you so much. Um, so, if uh, someone wants to add the uh, closing words from the panelists, Valeri, go ahead, and then we're gonna. Wrap Thank up you very much, Mike and John. Yes. Uh... I'd like to emphasize one thing that uh, actually we do have to stop to share any kind of bad narratives uh, by ourselves at first point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the second point is that Ukraine is already innovative, not only in different sector or military sector. We are innovative in the government sector and we have plenty of projects to share to the world that are actually happening and helping Ukrainian companies to evolve, to develop. And I am, I am personally one of example of such businesses that was created with the help and with the support of modern government. So this has to be shared to the world. We are on our way to changes. We are on our ways to reforms. We are evolving as a country, as a nation, and as each individual. So we will definitely uh, be best. And uh, this is what we have to share. And one more thing. You mentioned that we need investments in our defense sector and uh, attract some more VC funds to go into Ukraine and invest, invest, and invest. Uh, first of all, we need investments not only in the defense sector. We need investments in all economical sectors of Ukraine. And the second point, we don't have to wait until war will end. We are winning right now. So we need uh, help, support, and new lives coming into Ukrainian economy already today. These are words for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valeri. And uh, Mike, John, I think uh, the wrap up is in order. Um, so uh, one, one thing that I will add, and because there are a lot of questions about this, the context about the presentation um, from the attendees. So I would appreciate if we'll we do a systemic follow-up to everyone, you know, sharing the contact details uh, so people can reach out. Thanks. Yes, Dennis, I'll take a look at all of the questions and the um, emailers and uh, we'll review them and, and try to follow up with as many as possible. Uh, one question that did come in for Natalia is, can you share the slides from your presentation? If you can send them to me, I'll make sure that the attendees get them. So I, I want to thank you, Dennis, for being moderator and all your hard work today. And, and Natalia and Vitale and Valeri, excellent discussion. Really very informative. And I know our audience appreciated it greatly. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we do hope to have more sessions about Ukraine defense technology in the future. So if anyone wants to make any suggestions about some specifics, please send them to me. Um, the video from today's presentation should be available up on YouTube in no longer than a week. And once it's up on YouTube, we will email all of those who have attended today so that they can look at it again if they want. John, you have anything else to add? Yes, I, I would like to add. Uh, I take Valeri's comments to heart. And... <laughs> The reason why Ukraine is winning is because of people like you and Natalia and Vitaly and so many others, young people uh, who are uh, adaptive, uh, intelligent, creative, flexible, you name all those type of words, and you and your companies, your startups, 
have been able to integrate with the defense sector, you know, the bureaucracy of, of, a, of a nation. And that's not easy to do when you're applying these technologies to fighting a war. And but Ukraine, their their defense, their the military, and with people like you, you're showing reasons why Ukraine is winning. And it's going to be the success uh, of this type of adaption of uh, response that will win the war ultimately also. So I congratulate you all. I thank you all for participating. I thank the uh, individuals who have been watching this webinar, and I appreciate everything you've, you've done. Thank you very much on behalf of the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation. Thanks so much, John. Thank and you. Again, for me, thank thanks you. to all the participants today. And uh, we will be in touch to follow up on those questions. Take care, everyone. Slava Ukraini. Slava. 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 Slava.